Friends, hello and welcome to another episode of The Legal Breakdown. I am Jason Sansone with Sansone Howell Attorneys at Law, and we're happy to bring you yet another episode. For those of us that are watching online, we may have some technical issues. We're working to get that fixed, but otherwise, hopefully everybody will be with us here soon. Today, we're going to start our episode with a brief legislative update, and then we're going to move into part two of our bankruptcy series. So to start out, we have a guest on the phone, Mr. Corey Perry. Corey, how are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Oh, very, uh, very pleasure. Uh, Our honor to have you. Corey works for the Professional Oklahoma Educators Group, POE. POE was founded in 1988 by a group of educators, and they provide liability insurance and legal protection to educators in the state of Oklahoma. They are not a labor union, but is a nonprofit professional organization with a board of educator board of directors consisting of teachers, educators, and community business leaders. Corey, can you tell us just a little bit more before we start our legislative update about your organization and what some of their goals are? Absolutely. Well, again, um, professional Oklahoma educators would like to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you today and give you our perspective on the legislative session and what our goals are. Uh, We truly strive to give the best value and best performance and the best customer service for the professional educators that we represent here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, We offer a litany of services to our educators that we represent. Um, We have 24-hour uh, legal service for them where they're able to call in and speak with actual legal staff for us within 24 hours you will get a response even on weekends and holidays um, we offer up to two million dollar liability coverage per event for our teachers I mean, and the list goes on uh, we are next to none on price you're not going to beat us uh, we are roughly $21 per month uh, for our price, at roughly about $252 per year uh, for teachers. Uh, and again, those prices even change depending if you're a first-year teacher and uh, retired teachers and, and so forth. Uh, for us, this legislative session, though, our focus is really to remain resolved on continuing the necessary work that needs to be done uh, to help get education where it needs to be in the state of Oklahoma, and in particular for educators in Oklahoma. We want to see a reduction in classroom sizes. Uh, We want to increase teacher pay, of course, and we also want to add some teacher protections uh, because they are the backbone of education, and we need to make sure they're able to go to work and have a safe work environment so that they can educate our future. Well, that's wonderful to hear, Corey. So with that and and in your role, can you segue and tell us just a little bit about then what is going on at the Capitol? What are some of the bills we need to be aware of? Uh, You know, what's transpired so far with that? And what can we hope to see throughout the remainder of this legislative session? Well, right now as we speak, uh, the House Appropriations and Budget Committee should be convening. Uh, There was a little delay before we got on the call, but coming up in that committee is House Bill 1780. That is Speaker McCall's bill, and it will allow for a $1,200 increase to the minimum salary schedule here in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Many people heard uh, Governor Stitt call for that, and that bill is already getting ready to come through the committee process today. Also, we wanted to uh, see uh, more money being able to be saved for teachers. And so yesterday, House Bill 2644 uh, passed the uh, Appropriations Budget Education Subcommittee in the House. And what that does is it eliminates uh, the fees for licenses and certificate renewal for educators here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, For us also, we definitely want to make sure that teacher protection uh, is is something that's uh, going to be handled and taken very seriously. Um, We want to make sure that teachers, again, when they go to work, uh, there is uh, repercussions or consequences uh, should they be attacked. Right now, uh, we don't have enough protections for teachers uh, grades pre-K through fifth. Um, Those protections really start uh, sixth through twelfth. And so we want to make sure that we cover all teachers in the state of Oklahoma. So we're going to continue to fight for that. Uh, And when it comes to the issue of uh, reducing classroom sizes, uh, right now Senate Bill 571 is one of many bills uh, that have been uh, filed that would 
aim at reducing classroom sizes. It's a uh, standard bill. Uh, it requires each school district to submit a plan to reduce class sizes no later than June 30th of uh, next year. Uh, and they want that plan submitted to the State Department of Education. And it, it needs to talk about funding, uh, support personnel, teachers, and resources needed to implement that uh, goal over a five-year period. And so just those are a quick snapshot of, as you know, of a litany of uh, bills that really will get us where we're trying to get to uh, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, it's going to be uh, a continuous uh, fight, for lack of better terms, to make sure that we reach uh, the plateaus that we want to for education and our educators. Again, uh, we firmly believe that we have great professionals here in the state of Oklahoma that do this thing that we call education, and we want to make sure that they have what they need to be the most successful as they continue to take our future, the children, uh, where they need to be to go forward in life. You mentioned with regards to the teacher protections and that right now those start at a higher grade level. Can you tell us just a little bit more about that, of, of why that doesn't kick in at an earlier time or what has been done? Is there a pending bill to revise that right now, or is that just a future focus, maybe a, a lobbying point, if you will? Uh, that, for us, for sure, is a focus. Um, there is uh, legislation that we're looking at to try to get advanced uh, through. Uh, and the work is still being done. As you know, uh, we're only, we just completed the second week of session last week. We're, we're in the middle of the third week, and so work is going to continue to need to be done. Uh, right now, everything is looking at budgets and, and immediate monies for pay raises and things of that nature. And so, some of these other issues will come up later on in the process, but we're still very early. But for us, again, that is something that we take very serious, the protection of teachers and making sure that all teachers are protected. Well, that's wonderful. Um, and it's good to hear that your organization is out to do those things to try to protect the faculty in the state of Oklahoma um, and that we do have some progress at the moment. Um, has there been any movement on the big picture of budget, or are we still too early in the year to really talk about about appropriations and how the money may be divvied up eventually. Well, as you know, we still have to wait for the uh, final budget numbers to come out. Uh, there's a prediction of about $600 million. We've had some conversations on those numbers, and so we need to make sure that we get those final numbers so that we can really see what we uh, need to do big picture-wise. And I think as you get in uh, to latter part of this month going into the early part of next month, you'll probably see a lot of that stuff start to uh, take place and mold, and you'll have a better picture of what we're looking at. Um, but again, coming into session, uh, leadership was very clear that they wanted to be careful uh, with you know what we were hearing in new revenues and uh, what they would allocate towards education, and I haven't seen too much deviation from that. But again, from our perspective, um, we want to make sure that we fight for what teachers need, and we want to work right alongside with leadership and Governor Stitt to make sure that we can get those things accomplished for professional Oklahoma educators. Well, Corey, thank you so much for coming on. If there's anything else you'd like to add, otherwise I think we're going to move on with the program, but I very much appreciate you coming on. I'd like to possibly have you again in the future in a few weeks as progress will have been made in these areas, both in the House and the Senate, and we can get a future legislative update. Is there any last words you'd like to share with our listeners? Again, we want to thank you for your time to allow us to give our viewpoint and to speak on behalf of professional Oklahoma educators throughout the state of Oklahoma. And we thank you, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Well, friends, that was Corey Perry with the Professional Oklahoma Educators Association. And now we're going to segue into the next part of today's program. We began a series at the very first of our show on week one about bankruptcy. And we haven't had the opportunity to pick that topic just yet back up. And so today we're going to finally continue with that. And we're going to continue talking about the things you need to know in bankruptcy law. So very quick to rehash all of the things that we went over last time. There are four major areas that you should be aware of with regards to the differences between Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. Those are what we call the means test, which is going to look at the income for your household. In addition, then we have what is uh, some time limits between filings. And so it's seven years between Chapter 7 cases. If you've had a prior, it may dictate what you do in the future. 
Exempt property, meaning what is shielded by law, what assets you can keep, and the sheer natures of the case. And so we went over that very quickly. If you do not recall or you'd like more in-depth information on any of those topics, please visit our website at sansonehowell.com, S-A-N-S-O-N-E. H-O-W-E-L-L dot com. And you can rewatch our original program from week one where we in-depth discussed all of those issues. Also, I'd like to remind all of our listeners and viewers that we are live and you can call in live with your questions. The number is 405-347-7238. We'd be more than happy to take your call and answer direct questions about this topic. But now we're going to segue and talk about the timeline of a bankruptcy. After you have on your own or with counsel determined which direction you wish to go, whether that's Chapter 7, Chapter 13, or potentially even one of the other chapters in the bankruptcy code, you're most likely going to be looking at three different things to get you into a position to file that bankruptcy. What are those three things? Well, number one, you're going to have to complete a consumer credit counseling course. It is a requirement for any consumer debtor under any of the chapters in the bankruptcy code. So no matter how urgently you may want bankruptcy relief, if you're looking at a garnishment or maybe already being garnished, no matter how urgent you need to file that bankruptcy, you must have completed and have in hand that certificate of completion for a consumer credit counseling course. You can do those local, in person. You can do them online. You can do them telephonically, over the phone. But no matter how, which way you go about completing it, and whether that's something you do or whether an attorney assists you in setting up, it is something that needs to be done. Number two is all the information to complete your bankruptcy. So once again, if you are looking at doing this pro se, meaning on your own, or whether you're looking at hire an attorney, you're going to need to gather up a good bit of information. And the reality is that your attorney, unlike you, would not have known all the things that need to go into your case unless you provide that information. They haven't lived your life. They don't live in your house. They don't know your property. They don't know your debts. And so while the attorney's job is to know the law and to assist you in applying that correctly, it's up to you to bring to them the relative information or in your case to know that information and how it needs to fit into your specific bankruptcy. So first, you're going to want to make sure you have tax returns. Three years would be preferable. If you haven't filed taxes in some time and you were required to, and that's an important distinction, you need to get that done. Now, if you have not been required to file tax returns under internal revenue rules and the dollar amount of how much you make each year changes to be required to file a return, but if you've made less than, say, $12,000 each year, you're on fixed Social Security, maybe you've been unemployed, and you haven't been retire, ret required to file those returns, that's fine. But if you have been required to file a return and you haven't, you need to get that done. So you're going to want to gather tax returns. You're going to want to have bank statements. The trustee in your case will require them, and you need to get together at least the last three months for any depository account, meaning a checking or a savings account. It's also important to point out that these days there's a lot of accounts that people don't think are checking accounts, but in reality, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, the expression is, it's probably a duck. So there are prepaid cards, there's these money order cards, uh, Walmart has a green dot card, all different types of sort of non-traditional bank, non-traditional depository accounts. But if you can see where the money goes in, and you can see where the money goes out, the trustee is going to want that information. So whether that's some type of online printout, screen capture from an app, a printed bank statement, doesn't really matter. But basically, if you're putting your money into an account and you've got the ability to spend it, it doesn't matter that it's not a traditional bank like Bank of Oklahoma or Arvest Bank where you think of a true checking account, you're going to need to get statements for that. Okay, well, what else do you want? Make sure that you have a current valid photo ID and some form of proof of Social Security. The reason being is whenever it is time for you to go to court as part of your bankruptcy, and we're going to in a bit talk about that timeline and when you might go to court, but to get in the courthouse, the United States Marshal Service will require you to have a valid current photo ID. It could be a passport, it could be a driver's license, it could be a military ID, it could be a state-issued ID card. It doesn't matter so long as it's some government document with a picture 
and it has not expired. So double check that. Then, once you're in the building to conduct the 341 meeting of creditors, the trustee is going to need to make sure that the documents he has in front of him line up with identification you have available. And so that is why we need proof of Social Security numbers. A lot of times people want to use tax returns. Sometimes people think maybe they can use a birth certificate. None of that information will work. Number one, you don't have a Social Security number when you're born, and your birth certificate will not have a Social Security number on it. You receive a Social Security number issued from the Social Security Administration after you were born and usually use a birth certificate to obtain that. So that won't do you any good. A tax return has been prepared by you, and so you could put whatever number you want on there and then... Of course, it would be fraudulent, but it wouldn't be accurate. You're going to need some document that's been prepared by someone else. The most commonly used, of course, is a Social Security card. That's the most preferred option. If you don't have a Social Security card, you can use a recent W-2 or a recent 1099. You can also use a tax transcript or wage transcript because that's something you've received back from the Internal Revenue Service. They've issued it. Now it's going to be valid. You can use that to conduct the hearing or to prove up your social security number. But so just stepping back, make sure you've done your taxes, have copies of those tax returns. Make sure you have bank statements, and that can be more than maybe you think when we talk about bank statements, if it's not truly a bank, but accounting statements, you're going to need that. Copies of driver, have a valid driver's license and social security card. Make sure you've got those with you when you go to court. Then you're going to need copies of all auto titles. And the most important reason is so that your attorney or you and the trustee can determine whether there's any lien or if there's a valid lien on those vehicles. So sometimes people want to use registration forms, other documents that may show they own a vehicle, but those won't necessarily show what we call a perfected lien. That is the actual information listed on your title itself. That's why we're going to want the title. And so if you do not have a title, you've lost the title, the best thing to do is go to a tag agency and request a lost title. You're going to want that eventually anyways, because should you ever decide to sell that motor vehicle, you would need that information. So never a better time than now to get a title, hang on to it, keep it safe. The last separate documents that you're going to need, apart from you know, assets and, and debts, but the last separate document that you're going to need is something to demonstrate income. Now, for the majority of individuals, that would be pay stubs. So you're a, a W-2 wage employee. You would gather up and have together all of your pay stubs for the preceding six months. So if you were to file, say, today in February... The court or your attorney who would have ultimately file them with the court is going to want everything for September, October, November, December, January, February. You get the idea. So gather those up, have those available. But what if you don't have regular W-2 pay stubs? Well, then there's a couple different things. If you have a pension, a military retirement, VA disability, maybe you're on Social Security, they all will provide you annual benefit statements. Usually those are in the, go out in the month of December, and they'll tell you what you're going to receive for the next calendar year. That would be preferred. And so some type of statement that simply tells you what you receive every month. Now, you may be asking yourself, why can't I just look at a bank statement? Why can't I see what's direct deposited? And the answer is simple, because that only shows the net income and not the gross, and it doesn't show the full breakdown of your benefits or your income. So if you or your counsel were to try to rely on the numbers in a bank account, they wouldn't know, did Social Security take out for Medicare, or did your employer take out for a garnishment or child support or taxes? The gross and the deductions are equally important, and so you have to have the documents. You can't just go, af go off of what is in the bank statement. Okay, what if you're self-employed? What if you are 1099 contract labor? Well, then, in that situation, you're going to prepare a profit and loss sheet. You're going to prepare basically a ledger that shows what your gross for each month in the preceding six months would be, as well as deduct all of the relevant expenses that are applicable and appropriate. In this, 
situation obviously is similar because your business, you operating as a business or an independent contractor, they're paying you, but that is only going to be, you know, your gross is the business net logically, right? So the business has gross income, the total amount, you take out the expenses, then the money left over is your amount of money. That's the gross. So in that situation, you need to either on your own or work with counsel in trying to prepare some type of profit and loss statement to show um, what you've actually made for that period. Okay, so we talked about all the additional documents quickly. Also, you're going to need to gather up and, and know what are all your assets, what's all your belongings, what's all your possessions in the world, so that, again, you or an attorney can make sure they claim those properly as exempt. And you're going to want to know what all your debts are. It's very important you don't rely exclusively on a credit report because credit reporting is far from perfect. Credit reporting laws pretty much just say that should you credit report, it needs to be accurate. But there is no requirement that someone actually credit report. You and me right now, we could have a loan together. Nobody would know about it if one of us doesn't credit report it. So that is why you need to make sure you know what all your obligations are, what are your claims, what are your debts, and not just go off of any electronic system. No system's perfect. Only you have lived your life. Only you know what your debts are. So you're going to gather up the information, taxes, bank statements, auto titles, proof of income, assets, debts. Okay. Then that takes us to the third thing. So we've worked our way through. Number one was consumer credit counseling. Number two is all the information. And number three is either you're going to be paying for an attorney or potentially you're going to be filing this on your own. If you're filing the case pro se, if you're looking to do a bankruptcy on your own, realistically, you're still going to be looking at about $450 in total costs. It's $335 to file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy at present. It's $310 to file a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Those are statutory mandated costs. United States Courts Program sets that. Um, it's going to be consistent across the board. It, you don't have an option in that. The only things that I would note, though, are you can ask to pay that in installments. If you do not have an attorney, the clerk's office can provide you those forms, but you can ask to pay it out in portions, or under certain limited cases, you can ask for it to be waived altogether, and, and you may qualify, but I'll say that most of the time, and especially if you're retaining counsel, that's not going to happen. Uh, the, the logical idea being that if you can afford to pay an attorney, you've got to pay the court costs. You can't ask for no court costs, but also pay for a lawyer. In addition to those 310 or 335 expenses, you're going to likely be paying for credit reports, debtor education management, consumer credit counseling, all of which will add up to, like I said, around $400 to $450 total. So if you're doing it pro se without an attorney, that's something to keep in mind. So now we've discussed over the course of our first program and today, all the considerations that go into which way you should go, whether you're looking at Chapter 7 or Chapter 13, we've discussed what are some of the things you're going to do to get ready to file a case. And we broke that down into three simple, clear categories that we just highlighted of have to have a consumer credit counseling, what's the information necessary to file your case, and then some level of costs and fees. At that point, you're going to be ready to file the petition meaning you're going to file the bankruptcy. If you're working with an attorney, they're going to have you come in their office. They're going to ask you to review all the documents. Then you'll make sure they're correct. Whether you have to make changes or not, eventually you'll get those where they need to be. Then you'll sign them, and at some point your attorney would file them. Attorneys work differently. Some of them wait and file all their cases at the same time. In other situations, the attorney may file it with you right there. For attorneys, bankruptcy filings is an entirely electronic process. They use CMECF, or Court Management Electronic Case Filing System. So it's possible that your attorney decides to file that case with you in the office before you even leave. Either way, at some point, that case is going to be filed. If you're filing it on your own, you would go down to the bankruptcy court, you'd find the clerk's office, you'd provide them paper copies of everything you intend to file. 
regardless of which way you go, whether that's with an attorney who files it with you in the office or they file it later, whether you file it on your own, at some point this case is going to be filed. When it is filed, you'll receive a case number. And equally important, you're going to receive what's known as the automatic stay. What is the automatic stay? The automatic stay is sort of like a shield. It's designed to protect the debtor, the person filing bankruptcy, to give them breathing room so that the court can then do its job in assisting them in resolving the financial situation. So in the Tenth Circuit, which is where Oklahoma is situated, they've said that it is the goal is to maintain status quo. So by and large, this means creditors should not file new lawsuits against you, continue lawsuits against you. They shouldn't place a lien on your house. They shouldn't foreclose on a lien on your house. They shouldn't continue a foreclosure. They shouldn't continue garnishments against you. They shouldn't start new garnishments. Creditors aren't supposed to call you. They're not supposed to demand payment. They're not supposed to continue to send debt collection letters. All of those things that very likely you want to stop that has caused some form of stress as a result of your financial hardships, you're going to get breathing room on that immediately. Now, you haven't received a discharge. Your debts are not wiped out on day one. That comes later in bankruptcy, and we're not even going to reach that in today's program. We have four minutes left. We're going to continue to address some things, and then we'll continue in our part three about bankruptcy of the full timeline for both the Chapter 7 and the Chapter 13, because they look a little bit different. But backing up, You've now received the automatic stay. What comes next? Well, the next thing is that you need to know when you've got to go to court, and that is critical. And by and large, there's very little excuse to miss that court date. Most importantly, I have to work is not an excuse at all for missing that court date. You've asked for special protections. You've asked for relief Um, under the bankruptcy code and asking the federal government to assist you, you have to now do your part. You have to maintain some of those obligations. They're not large. They're not significant. One of them is simply attending what's called a meeting of creditors. By law, it's going to be at least 21 days after the date of filing, and at least in the Western District of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, you're going to know the next business day when that court date is. So you have three weeks to make the arrangements to appear at that. It's going to be no longer than one hour, and it's going to be very likely either a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or a Thursday. All new Chapter 13 cases in the Western District of Oklahoma are set on Thursday mornings. Chapter 7 cases are typically on Tuesdays and sometimes on Wednesdays. With Chapter 7 cases, they're half-hour docket calls. They're one-hour docket calls for Chapter 13s. With the Chapter 13s, there are going to be three different windows in the morning on Thursday. With the Chapter 7s, they could be any time during the day. But what matters is we're not talking about multiple days. We're not talking about even a whole day. If you're a Chapter 7 case and you are set at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, you need to arrive a little bit early. You need to make sure you have time to get there and park. You need to make sure you get through the metal detector and, and U.S. Marshal Security and to arrive where you need to be. But after that... You should be out of there by 2.30, even if it runs long for whatever reason, and the trustees had a lot of cases that day, maybe 2.45 by the time you're leaving and walking out the building. So it's not going to be a situation where you arrive at 9 and you don't get to leave until 2 in the afternoon. That should not occur. Well, do you have to go back? How many times are you going to have to go to court? That depends on whether that meeting of creditors is what's called continued or concluded. In other words... Did you get everything wrapped up, or does it have to go on another time? If you and your attorney did everything right, and you took care of all you needed to take care of beforehand, and at that particular meeting of creditors, you should only have to go that one time. If not, if you and or your attorney did not fulfill all the requirements or the trustee wants more information, whether it's a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13, you may have to attend another meeting of creditors. Okay, well, folks, we're going to begin to wrap up today's 
program because we've reached a great stopping point and we're nearly out of time. We're going to continue this as we go forward and we talk now about what the timeline differences are between Chapter 7 and Chapter 13, what you can expect in the future. Next week, we're going to pick this back up, and we may or may not have another legislative update uh, from Mr. Perry, who we heard from earlier today. We want to thank him for being on the program and for assisting in this show. I look forward to speaking with everybody next week. Folks, have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Be safe. This has been The Legal Breakdown.